When philosopher Hugh McCann died in 2016, I found myself affected. Why, I wondered. I didn't know him that well. I'd spent two delightful days with you several years earlier, interviewing him twice for Closer to Truth. But why my emotional reaction? Part of the reason, no doubt, was the many hours going through transcripts and editing the Closer to Truth TV episodes and web videos in which you appeared. We at Closer to Truth grow close to our contributors. They become our personal friends. But even such familiarity didn't seem sufficient to explain the loss I felt. There had to be something more, a deeper reason for my feelings. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. On hearing of Hugh McCann's death, I decide to review my conversations with him, relive them, experience them anew, see what strikes me now, see if I can find a clue for my unexpected reaction to Hugh's death. Hugh began his career as a philosopher of action, later pursuing philosophy of religion, especially God's nature and sovereignty, which is when I came to know him and on which I focused. Hugh, I would like to believe in God, but rather than dealing with all the proofs or disproofs of God's existence, I like to focus on, all right, if God exists, what is this entity that is called God? Does God have a nature? Does God have traits? Is like a personality? I think if you want to ask whether God has a nature, in part what we're inclined to think is, does God have a nature that is, as it were, given to him, that just comes with being God and it isn't really up to him? So the real then question becomes, is it the case that God's nature is imposed on him? And that has two parts. One has to do with the things that God creates, and whether he's forced to create the way he does. And the other has to do with, with God's own nature, which, which we don't think he creates himself. That, is, that doesn't sound right. So on the first score, if you want to say that it is not forced upon God that he be good as creator or so forth, then you have to adopt a view according to which creation is not a matter of deliberation or prior planning or choosing among prior plans and then pulling a universe into existence. That's not creation, that's manufacturing or, or conjuring or something like that. In creation, the plan comes with the product. And so in that situation, there is no prior constraint on God as to what he may do. But if you, if you turn to God's own nature and say, okay, well, is, is it really up to God whether, he, whether he's like internally good? Is it up to God whether he has a will? That's a little bit harder, but there is a way to do it. And the way is to treat God not as a being who acts, but to treat him as the action, the action itself. If you make it out that God is in fact a kind of act of will, then you get this, that acts of will, taking decision as the model which has to be intrinsically intentional, or there's always, we must intend to decide as we decide. So if you look at God as an act of will, then you might say something like this, that even though God does not bring himself into existence, he's not self-creating in that sense, nevertheless, he means to be everything he is. And that's intrinsic to his nature. Uh, are, are you taking a behaviorist approach to God that you can only judge what God does, you can't judge what's internal in, in God's well, I'm not, mind? No, I don't really mean to take it that way. If we take God basically as, as an instance of willing, then what we mean is something like this, that even if God does not bring himself into existence, neither is he stuck with himself. Because an act of will is a spontaneous thing, first of all, and it's something that we mean to be engaged in. So what you have is a God who is spontaneously all that he is and means to be that, even though he's not bringing himself into existence. So the features, right, that pertain to God are all there right from eternity. That the, the God who is ultimately simple, nevertheless, is, is as it were, uh, manifested in all the things that he is and does. Right. Okay? And what he does is, as I say, spontaneous and intentional. So he means to be everything he is. Nothing counts as a way he's inclined to act. They're only his actions. Nothing counts as a belief he might express or that he might come to recognize if he were to think about it because he knows everything immediately. Nothing counts as an intention that he may or may not put into action because all of his intentions are realized. And so what does that mean about God's nature, ultimately? What it means is that it's a nature that, that is in accordance with his will, even though it is not produced by him. 
you set as priority God's sovereignty. Yes, and God's sovereignty is manifested, though, in, in the situation where the actual comes first, rather than the possibilities and the necessities and all that sort of thing. So there's nothing thing. To, compare it to, to compare it with. It just is what it is. It is what it and is. And your bedrock is God's absolute control. Right. The way it works is God creates the whole thing in one fell swoop from an eternal perspective, right? So that the whole thing, then in God's case, the whole history of the universe appears, it's, it's just present as a unit to him, present, so to speak, on hand. Hugh McCann received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1968 and joined the Department of Philosophy at Texas A&M University, where he remained a respected and beloved member of the faculty until his retirement not long before his death in February 2016. Hugh's vision of God's absolute sovereignty as creator is majestic, awe-inspiring, and, as he tells it, breathtaking. A reviewer of Hugh's last book, Creation and the Sovereignty of God, wrote, Rarely do we find a work in philosophical theology that is novel, yet firmly entrenched within the theistic tradition. Well, if you think that God is a non-temporal being, then you have to think of creation a certain way. You have to think of him as aware of the entire history of the universe in one glance. And so he observes past, present, and future at the same time. Now, if as creator, he's also lending existence to that entire history, then one would say that his providence automatically extends to that history. Providence is basically what it means is God's taking care of business. It means basically he's taking care of the world. One supposes that he has good objectives as creator and that those objectives extend to all of the things that he creates. And so that everything that's out there would be ordered toward some ultimate good end and his providence would be what directs things toward that end. Look, God can't create a chair and not create it in any position. He can not create something that is, for example, a billiard ball that is neither moving nor at rest. Rather, he has to settle all of those things. This is though an artist were painting a picture. Ahead of time, you can think you want a tree somewhere in the picture, but not settle where. But when you're creating the picture, that tree has to go someplace, hmm. and it has to be someplace particular. And the same goes for every other characteristic that anything would have, that if God's providence is complete, then everything has to be settled in that single act of creation, which gives the world its being. You make it seem that the world in its being is like a machine, that you design it, wind it up, and then it just happens, and nothing can happen inside that machine other than it had been pre-programmed and pre-engineered. Well, but there's nothing pre-programmed or engineered, and there is no ahead of time. You don't wind it up and let it go because you're creating the whole thing. There may be a beginning to the, to the universe in time, but from God's perspective, you don't wind it up at the beginning and then let it go on its own. It's never on its own as far as the existence of thing is, things is concerned. So sure. That's settled only by God. But there's nothing in there that says that it's settled in a way that doesn't allow natural causation to operate, settled in a way that doesn't allow natural processes to occur just as they would be otherwise, settled in a way that doesn't allow our uh, deliberation and decision making to proceed uh, in just the way we would want it to. If we think of God as a creator of the world in a true sense, in a sense that we would never dignify with the name creation, a human process of just copying from some instructions that you were given to make something, that's not creation. If you want to say God is the creator of the world, what you want is for the plan and the product to, to come at once. And remember, there's no time that it takes to create. So what you're seeing when God creates us, he sees us in our complete career with all the decisions that we make, all of it as, as it were, as a finished product, okay? And in seeing it, he is at the same time willing it. So it says what we get in Genesis. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that it was good, are just three descriptions of precisely the same event. Seeing that it's there, seeing that it's good, seeing that it is, are all the same for God. So there's no way in which in creating us and being completely providential toward us, there's no way that God is doing anything to us. He's not operating on us. He's not putting us there and then picking out an action that we're going to perform, we're already there. I'm having trouble with this, with this big distinction between God being the creator as making a plan and God being the creator as manufacturing the goods. But you're saying that 
There's no time, obviously. Both happen simultaneously. God doesn't plan it. Right. It just happens from God. It's so, it, That's right. Only an inferior God would need a plan. A perfect God is like a perfect improvisational musician. Since there is no prior plan, there's nothing to be talked about as far as how things could have been. There are no could-haves or might-haves about something that doesn't exist even in the abstract yet because you can't talk about it. And one of the consequences of the view, in fact, is that you don't get something like triangularity until you have triangles. So there's no abstract objects, no other possibilities. It's not a possible world, it's the world. There's there are no else. other possibilities to speak of because yeah. it's not there yet. On well, the same way, if you want to talk about possible worlds and best possible worlds, there is no prior set of possible worlds from which God selects, rather he creates the world. And possibilities can then be spoken of. But until then, there's nothing to, to talk about. For Hugh, the absolute sovereignty of God was always predominant and unassailable. Hugh McCann is survived by his wife for 50 years, Janet McCann, a poet and long-term professor of English at Texas A&M, and by his four children and seven grandchildren. Hugh's early work was in action theory, where he formulated a teleological theory of action that focuses on mental states, intentions, motivations, desires, as reasons, but not as causes, of actions. One thing I worry about is what it is to decide to do something for one reason rather than another. Let's say I have more than one reason for deciding to take a vacation in Italy. One might be to, to tour some sites and look at some churches and some museums and so forth. Our decision making relates to the reasons that we have for deciding the way we do. So if you come up to a point at which you have to make a decision, you've got sometimes reasons for doing one thing, reasons for doing another thing. You have to settle between them. Right. And the question then is, how is it that the reasons are related to the decision? If you are a believer in liber libertarian free will, you don't think that they're causes, you think they're something else. And so then you ask yourself, well, what does it mean to decide for one reason rather than another if it's not something causal? What it means to decide for one reason rather than another is simply that you form an intention that reflects the one reason rather than the other, right? Okay, what's the significance of that? That gives you a non-causal account of what it means oh. to decide for one reason rather than the other. Mm. So, mm. Because you simply take the content of the desire, all right, the, the contemplated end, and you simply take that and you reform it uh, into an intention, right? So that your mind is doing a certain kind of information processing. Mm. It's taking a thought that comes to you in the shape of a desire and a way to achieve the desire. And you simply then recast that as an intention. As a professor, you was always approachable, a constant resource to his students. Many became his lifelong friends. Hugh's teaching centered on philosophy of mind, especially the theory of action, and on philosophy of religion, and in relation to both, the problem of free will and the metaphysics of events. Hugh, you seem to want to do the impossible, to make God fully sovereign in his control, and to make human beings fully free in their free will. How do you harmonize such a contradictory position? Well, it, harmonizing divine sovereignty and human freedom is in part gonna depend on what you think human freedom is. It's in part gonna depend on what you think divine sovereignty is or how it, how it is exercised by God. Now, in my view, human freedom is not a matter of us causing our own actions. And the reason is because if you cause your own actions, it has to be either by some other action that you perform, which leads to an infinite regress, because each time you have this separate action, you have to worry about whether it's free. Then the other possibility is you could cause the action as part of the action itself. But then you have something causing itself, and that doesn't seem right. So it doesn't look like you can have humans causing their action. It leaves you two options. One is there is no cause, and then you have to face classical objections against libertarianism that it means that there are some events in the universe that are just purely random, have no explanation, whatever, and we're stuck with them. And then the other alternative is you try to invoke God as cause and see if you can do so in such a way that human freedom is preserved. To me, what human freedom is, is that you're not acted upon by anybody or anything, so nothing is done to you that 
results in your choosing the way you choose. The other thing is that the choice is spontaneous, and I suppose that just goes with action as that kind of spontaneity. And the other thing is the choices are always uh, intrinsically intentional. You can't decide to do something and not mean to decide, and in fact not mean to decide exactly what you're deciding. So it's not as if it befalls you or anything like that. So that's what I think freedom consists in, and then I want to make divine causation consistent with that. And the way to do that, I think, is to realize that when God creates us or creates the universe, two things are true. First of all, God is not a temporal being, so he creates everything at once. And the other thing is that God doesn't choose among options. What happens is just us. And what God does first is he creates us. So he doesn't select a thing. The only selecting that's done is done by you and me in, in framing questions and giving answers. And there's no reason why that can't be free. It's not just God creating the environment for us to work in. It's God creating the specific actions, everything we're doing. That's right. what you're telling it's me. Also, it's also the contemplation of the possibilities, the recognition of them, the agonizing right, right, over right, right. them. Everything. All those, everything. All God's causing still, everything. Right. And I'm still free. And we're still free. I'm still mystified. Well, because you think either there were prior possibilities and, and I'm denying that, right? Because the possibilities aren't there until after the reality is there. Prior to the reality being there, there's nothing to be spoken of, right? Or you think if there aren't any prior possibilities, then there must have been a prior necessity. But there wasn't any prior necessity either. All there is is what there is. Hugh enjoyed serving the profession of philosophy, particularly via the American Philosophical Association. He was a former editor of the Journal of Philosophical Research. Why we hold people responsible in a, in a free will setting, okay? And this I'm very up in the air about. We say that we blame people or reward them or punish them or praise them in order to influence their conduct. But if you're going to be a libertarian about free will, then you're not thinking of that as a causal process exactly. And yet we still think that by visiting uh, hardship on people, which is what we do when we punish them, or by uh, visiting some good upon them, which is what we do when we reward them, we still think that we can influence their conduct. That is a bit of a mystery to me, is what happens when a person, as a result of encountering hardship for something that they did, why is it that they change? What exactly is the effect that that has on people. And of course, praise has the opposite effect. I don't understand the ordering of that cause and the consequence that it has, or that input and the consequence it has, because no matter whether you're a libertarian or a determinist, you still have to have some account of what it is to hold a person responsible, what it is to hold oneself responsible, and how it is that those mechanisms work and lead us to do the things that we do, to alter our behavior in the ways we do. So we, we're thinking, uh, how is it that we would think about it if it was from a theistic perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, part of the question is, what is it to be responsible and to take responsibility for ourselves? Well, one way to look at the Adam and Eve story is to make it out that original sin was Adam and Eve deciding, well, look, we're going to take responsibility for ourselves here. We're the ones who are going to settle our destiny and get ourselves knowledge of good and evil and become like God and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which taking responsibility for yourself can be an, an, an act of pride. But there's also a better sense, and, and, and that's a sense in which we acknowledge the things that we do as being our own, as decisions that we've made, actions that we have performed, and for which we are answerable in the sense that if there is a price to be paid or an apology to be made, that it's ours to do. And that the only way that we can come to grips with ourselves and what we are and what we've made of ourselves is to move forward in such a way that we acknowledge what it is that we've done in the past, good and bad. Entirely reasonable, but right. why does that have any greater uh, purchase uh, under a theistic worldview than under uh, an atheistic worldview. From a theistic perspective, there is a providence of God that is behind what we are and what we are to become. So that it's easier for us to face up to uh, what may be our own spiritual needs or the shortcomings in our actions, because from a theistic perspective, you have a God that you can, that you can pray to, that you can depend upon to, as it were, help you come to grips. Hugh was both a creative and a rigorous philosopher. As his colleague Robert Audi wrote, in his theory of mind and free action, and in his work in the theory of value and the foundations of ethics, he provided a basis for affirming human dignity.
Most of theism thinks of, of evil in two ways. That first of all, they think about what, the, what we call sin, right? which essentially boils down to evil exercises of the will that, let, let us say, run counter to divine commands. Mm -hmm. right? Then, on the other hand, there's suffering, which is a, rather a different thing and, and would be there and might very well be there even if no sin was ever committed. There are different ways of dealing with the sin part. Some say that's just our doing and you don't lay it at God's door. It's, it's our fault. Yes. Well, I don't, I don't think that. The so-called free will defense. Yes, everyone who thinks that, let's say, that God knows what world he's creating when he creates the world has to face the issue that God knows what evil actions are going to be performed. If you don't grant God that knowledge, then, in fact, you're diminishing God as far as omniscience is concerned. You appear, at least, to be saying, look, there are certain things that are going to happen that God doesn't yet know about. If he does know what's going to happen, yeah. then you have to ask yourself, well, then what justifies his creating the world in which this evil occurs? Yes. On most treatments of evil, evil is, is viewed as a kind of foreign interloper in the world, right? Something that, that, that enters, as it were, almost surreptitiously and that is not wanted and with which we have to somehow cope, Absolutely. and God must somehow cope as best he can, right. and I don't think that's the game at all. I think what's going on in the world is that part of the enterprise of creation is to overcome evil, that that's part of the deal. When it comes to sin, then you have to ask yourself, well, how is it that sin is overcome? You can say, well, look, what God wants is God, God wants a relationship of friendship with us. Well, friendship can't be forced on people. It has to be freely chosen. You certainly can have suffering without, without right. sin. Right. What is the effect that suffering can have on us? Well, it can lead to hopelessness. It can lead to despair. It, it can lead to us giving up. It can lead to us becoming embittered you know, cursing whatever God they may be, or it can have the opposite effect. It can make you determine that you're going to overcome it. So it turns out that the challenge that suffering presents is actually overcome by our becoming more virtuous, right? And more courageous and more patient and, and loving with others. Okay, the, right? the counterexamples to what you're talking about are when the suffering occurs to children who are just killed. Okay, so, so here's, here's where, the, where one has to bite down hard on, on a hard nut, okay? <laughs> there are two ways you can handle it. One is you can say, well, look, God has eminent domain here. Yeah. This, the state when it wants to put a road through, it doesn't have to knock down everybody's house, just in order to be justified in knocking yours down. Okay. <laughs> That's the hard nut. <laughs> right. But the other way is, is, is the way that I think is implicit in, in, in the book of Job, where you say, look, I don't know what this is for. I don't know how to cope with it, but it's not my world. We don't get an answer to the problem of evil when we read the book of Job, but he got his, and his was shut up. <laughs> At the time of his death, Hugh was working on a paper, no surprise. A philosopher of wide knowledge and keen powers of analysis, Hugh McCann was a source of edification and a fountain of ideas. He combined encouragement with criticism, often suffused with humor. He took his work seriously, but never himself. What does it mean to accept that God is free? Well, many have thought that he was not. Many have thought that since God is perfectly good and all-knowing, that he must choose the best possible world to create. Now, in my view, there are two things to be said about that. First, since there are no prior plans, there's no choice to be made among possible worlds because a possible world is just a prior plan. Secondly, though, there's this. The classical view of God's goodness was that it was not dispositional. That is to say that God didn't tend toward doing good things or have a liking for doing good things or anything like that. God was supposed to be perfectly in act or purely in act. And what that would mean would be this, that God's goodness depends entirely and is entirely a matter of what he does, not what he's disposed to do. Did God have to create this world? No. To me, it's wrong to make any modal statements about God. So it is not the case that he had to create the world. It's not the case that he could have created another. He simply created the world or creates the world. So God can be free with totally no choices. With totally no modal statements true about him, okay? With no cans and coulds, right? He's free in the sense that he transcends even the possible. It is so obvious to me now. The reason why Hugh McCann's death affected me was that he made me think about God as I never had thought before. Hugh's radical God floored me, a God that is the action, not the actor, a God that doesn't plan, 
no deliberations, no dispositions, no possibilities, a God of maximum, absolute sovereignty. It's not that I now believe that Yu's kind of God actually exists, or for that matter, that any kind of God actually exists, but because I wonder whether there is a supreme being, and if so, what a supreme being could be like, that I so appreciate Hugh's intuitions. I do not believe that Hugh McCann had special access to ultimate reality, or that he had a special message from the divine. But he made me think about God as I'd never imagined, a single sharp insight of profundity and power. I am and shall remain in Hugh McCann's debt for having taken me just a little closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.